Well, good morning, family. I hope we're still fired up for church here this morning. We're going to get into the Word of God here. But before we get into God's Word, I do want to just let us know that an incredible couple, Nick and Jesse Cly, are here worshiping with us. So awesome. Uh, but my name is Matthew Rodriguez, and I get the honor and the privilege of leading the mighty West region, amen. And of course, I get God's honor of preaching his word here this morning. You know, in 606, there was a mass deportation of three major deportations of God's people in Jerusalem. In 597, there was a second deportation. In 586, the temple of God and Jerusalem all together were completely destroyed. You know, here this morning, my family, I just want you to know that I am here in a desperate effort to rouse this room, to get us to walk out of here, the wild, radical revolutionaries, the disciples of Jesus Christ that God would want us to be. You know, incredibly, in 606, Jeremiah prophesied that after 70 years, that God would deliver his people out of their captivity in Babylon. In 536, 70 years to the day, God sends Cyrus of the Persian Empire and sends the first remnant of God's people back to Jerusalem to build the temple of God. By 516, the temple is rebuilt by Zerubbabel, and with the encouragement and spurring on of the prophet Haggai and Zechariah. And we find ourselves here, we're going to study out the book of Nehemiah. We find ourselves in 466 AD. This is 50 years after the temple of God had been rebuilt. But yet, Jerusalem had still lied in ruins. There was still destruction that surrounded them. Turn your Bible to Nehemiah 1. In Nehemiah 1, in verse 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, on the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Here we jump into a passage, a time in history, where though that all that God accomplished through uh, Zerubbabel and the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, Nehemiah got news from one of his brothers that was in Jerusalem. He says, the city that God has sent us back to rebuild, it still lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah's response is one that we can only expect. He just breaks. It says that he's sad that in this city, the city of God, the place where God was supposed to dwell, is completely destroyed. And it wasn't that the fact that it was just destroyed, but the fact that it was laid in ruins for over five decades that people had seen, known. And Nehemiah, it says here later in the passage, that he was actually a cupbearer to the king, meaning that he was not just the guy that just made sure the poison wasn't in the food and in the drink, but this would have been a close confidant of the king. 
It would have been somebody that would have been a military strategist. Somebody that would have had the ability, had the resource, had the, the, the opportunity to make a difference of the circumstance. And so his heart is broken because he realizes he could have been there to make a difference of the situation. But yet, he was lying in a, pa in a, in a palace with luxury, protection, everything was taken care of, security. And he hears that his family, his people, his countrymen are without protection and their city is completely destroyed. Nehemiah's heart hurt for the people of God. It says that he weeps, he fasts, and he prays to God. I mean, can you imagine? You go to your hometown right now and you find it completely in ruins. You just get word that the place where you went to school, the place where you were in middle school and high school and you spent your young years is completely destroyed. And the people there are in disgrace and despair. Nehemiah's heart was broken. Jump down to chapter 2 and verse 1. It says in verse 1, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you were not ill? This cannot be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. You got to have a quick prayer before you request the king. He says, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant is found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. You know, incredibly, Nehemiah's response to his brokenness was to boldly go before the king. Now it says, and it specifies that Nehemiah was sad in the presence of the king. And then it responds afterwards saying that he was very much afraid. The reason being because if somebody was sad in the presence of the king, it disrupts the king's peace. You don't want to disrupt the king's peace right there. In a very real way, Nehemiah's life was at risk in this moment. So because of his response, because of his love for his people, he put his life on the line for the people. He said, nothing has been done. You know what? I've got to get radical. I've got to do something about this. And so he goes before the king, not before. He says, Good God, be, be with me right now. Just be with me in this moment. And he puts his request. And, and the king, Artaxerxes, says, you know what? I will send you. And so he sets a time. You know, Nehemiah is set out on this journey to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And I believe God has called this very room not to rebuild physical walls of Jerusalem, but we are here to build the walls of Christianity. The title of my lesson is just that, Rebuilding the Walls of Christianity. Turn your Bible over here to Nehemiah 2 and verse 11, though you're already in chapter 2. In verse 11, after he receives the, the granted request of the king, we drop down to verse 11. It says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I have not told anyone what God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went through, out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. 
Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I'd gone or what I, was, what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, do you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work, and the church said, Amen. Nehemiah, he goes to Jerusalem. And in the incredible moment we find ourselves in is he arrives at this place. And Nehemiah's great plan to rebuild the wall, to bring glory back to the city of God, it began with one thing. He examined the walls. My first point for you is examine the wall. You know, Nehemiah, being the incredible strategist and, and, uh, and, and military strategist that he was, this is why scholars believe, actually, that when Nehemiah went to examine the wall, he didn't just go and look at a, the grand scheme of it. He went through every gate that would have surrounded the walls of Jerusalem. There were about nine gates that surrounded the city. And I believe the reason why the scripture even constantly repeats the walls have been destroyed and its gates which have been destroyed by fire, I believe because it softened Nehemiah's heart and it kept him connected with the level of tragedy that the people of God had faced. You see, Nehemiah, he stopped at each moment. He stopped at each gate, each part of the wall that was totally destroyed. And he connected with it. And he made it personal. Knowing, I mean, can you imagine the city that in 1000 BC, at the height of Israel's reign, when King David was in power, this place was flooded with resource, with money. I mean, people were dancing through the streets. There was constant celebration. This was the most powerful nation in the world. Had now been in disgrace. And so each moment I can imagine him just recollecting on the history that would have been his bedtime stories. Wow, this was the place where God had blessed his people with prosperity. He protected them. They never worried about enemies on each side. And now this place is broken. It's destroyed. It's completely in ruins. You notice how he specifically says that the, so, the wall was so dismantled, so disfigured, that the one mount, the one horse that he had, he couldn't even get through certain parts of the wall. It was so destroyed. It was so broken. But Nehemiah doesn't let any of the people know what he's doing. Because it wasn't about what, what are the people thinking? Hey, man, what, what, what's going to happen? He took ownership upon himself. He personally took the responsibility for the state of the walls of Jerusalem, of the nation of God. He said, you know what? I don't want to ask anybody just yet. This has got to be my responsibility first. I'm going to put the whole nation on my back. You know, he then turns to the people after examining all the gates. He looks at them and he says, do you see? Do you see this? Do you see the destruction of the wall? Do you see how dismantled it is? And it's been like this for 50 years. And he was asking them not if they really saw it. They had been there for so long. He was asking them if they had enough yet. Are you done allowing the walls to be destroyed? And see, for us here this morning, knowing we're not building a physical wall, as it says in Isaiah 26, what are the walls that we're rebuilding? It says, in that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. 
The very walls we are rebuilding are not physical, but they are spiritual. It is the walls of what it truly means to be a sold-out disciple of Jesus. What we are facing, family, is a daunting task. If you are a guest here this morning, we're not just a local church here. We have a global vision to see the world recaptured, recaptivated, and rearrested by the very scriptures of God. We have a global vision. We are not just trying to be your nice church on the corner as you saw in the GNN. We are not just your church next door. We are a worldwide movement. But we are a group of people that have examined the walls and taken full responsibility for the spiritual state of the world. We're not waiting on humanitarian efforts. We're not waiting on politicians. We're not waiting on bills to be passed. We're not waiting on people to just feel good about it. We are going to take responsibility. (laughs) Nevertheless, though we have taken this responsibility, the task is great. It is a daunting task. But we would be unwise to not examine the walls of Christianity today. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. He then warns, Paul warns Timothy, he says, But keep your head in all situations. What was he warning him? He says, Timothy, I must warn you as my son, as my understudy. The church that you are part of, that you're in leadership of, this church will get dismantled. Savage wolves will come in and turn people away from the sovereign God for which they said was Lord. They will introduce destructive heresies. They will totally have false prophets among you. But guard yourself. You must know the difference between sound doctrine and myths, between those that are right and those that are wrong, those that know the Bible, those that don't. This will be your standard. You know, some may say, well, that, that, that's not really our reality. I think church is just fine. I think, hey, if you go to different churches, it's totally cool. Hey, you don't actually have to know the scriptures. This is the reality, family, that we have been raised up in. Church has become more of about the consumer than about the creator. Church has become where you can go to hometown buffet and choose what type of church you go to. You say, you know what? I don't like the Mediterranean. I'm more into the vegetarian option. I like the vegan option. We're not against any vegans, so you can be vegan, amen. But he says, whatever choice you want. That's the Christianity you can have. If you like the less committed version, then you can just do that. We live in a world where your emotions have become the standard of your Christianity. We live in a world where you don't have to actually even know or obey the Bible anymore. You can simply rely on your experience to be the coattails of your faith. We live in a world where Christianity has been infested with the world instead of the Christianity infesting the world. We live in a world where pedophilia has totally entered the church. For thousands of years till now, instead of the church going into all the world, all the world has come into the church. Christianity has become such destruction. We have resulted in just saying, you know what? I can't deal with all this confusion. Let's just say all the ways are the ways to God. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, not the ways, not the truths, not the life, there is one way to Jesus, and that is final. You know, in 1830, a false doctrine came about only 193 years ago, where they developed this doctrine based off the ease and just trying to work with the people and work with the times, that you could just pray Jesus in your heart and he'll come in. Let me tell you something. This is the most prevalent false teaching today. 
where all you have to do is believe in Jesus and somehow you don't have to change your life. You don't even have to know the scriptures. In fact, the Bible teaches directly against this principle in James 2 where it says you are saved not by faith alone, but yet it's become the most prevalent false teaching. Knocking at the door. Jesus is waiting for you to allow him to come in. Allowing him to be Lord. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus is Lord. Yeah. But, but, but here, here's the thing. Even if you haven't acknowledged that yet, Jesus is still Lord. Yeah. Jesus is Lord of UCLA, USC, Metro Coast. Jesus is still Lord. Yeah. Well, one of the saddest of all is that the most, the most, Widely debated topic is the very center and point where somebody actually receives salvation. Baptism is now the most contended and and controversial topic, though it's very clear in the scriptures. You're lucky I got a time here because I dive into that bad boy right there. That that was tempting. That was tempting right there, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. If you ever read a book called 1984, George Orwell writes a, writes a book where essentially the premise of it is communism comes to America. But he understands, he said, the, the, the government knows, they're like, they're not going to like this. They're not going to like this. They're going to hate this. People are going to just totally want to rebel against this principle. Okay, this is what we're going to do. We'll send in what is called a secret police. And what they'll do is they'll whisper about revolution. They'll whisper about, hey, we're going to overthrow the government. We're going to turn communism and make it back to, you know, capitalism. We're going to do whatever we want. We're going we're to be the authority. And then as soon as all the would-be revolutionaries gather, the government owns the rebellion. Here's the thing, family. It is the very thing Satan has done to Christianity. Consider this for a second. There's a God. We all believe that. Amen. That means there is an antagonist. There is Satan here on this earth that he knows. He's like, man, I know people want to be with God. I know you want to worship God. You know what? I'm not going to destroy that. No, 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 no. I'm going to give you many gods to worship. I'm going to give you comfort. And so he gathers. He says, you know what? You can have the, hey, I feel my way to Jesus. You can have the, hey, you know what? Some churches, there is actually a church in the Bay Area, I found out before I left, that they will hand you a packet of zigzags and say, hey, roll up the blunt that you want, but as long as you say Jesus' name and as long as you're worshiping God. Whatever type of church you want, I'm going to own the rebellion. This is why, how many of us grew up going to church? Many of us grew up going to church. How many of us actually knew the Bible? How many of us actually studied the Bible? Family, we've been sold a destroyed way of Christianity. We have been part of the rebellion that we thought we were so radical when we raised our hand and walked down to the altar. We thought we were so radical when we decided to memorize John 3.16. But yet if somebody were to come up to you and ask you, Hey, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Do you know fundamentally how to break down what it actually means to follow Jesus? Not according to the 40,000 different denominations of Christianity, not according to people, but according to what Jesus actually says. And absolutely, it's emphatic. Nobody actually knows. You know, I preach hard, but I preach hard because this was me. I was that... Young man, fired up, zealous. You think I'm fired up now? I was zealous when I was not a disciple. I was just zealous for darkness. And in a very real way, my uncles are are Baptist preachers to this day. I went to church. It wasn't like I didn't go to church. But let me be honest with you. It never really had an impact on my life. I walked into those services and I fell asleep. I I was singing in the choir. Only time I was awake was when I was singing in the choir. I don't know why Andre don't let me sing. I don't know what it is. I've been singing in the choir since I was young. I don't know what it is. That's that's hurtful. It's hurtful for sure. 
Um, but, but, but we'll talk about it later. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get open about it after this. But I would fall asleep in church. The reality is I was addicted to pornography, masturbation. I was your consummate example of what a womanizer was. I was trying to sleep with as many women as I possibly could. The darkest of darkest lives. But at church on Sunday, praise God, hallelujah. I'm a church going, and when somebody would ask me, I would say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, though my life fundamentally did not look separate of an atheist. I looked just like I didn't believe in God. And so honestly, to this day, when I share my faith, I say I was a practical atheist. Because practically, nothing of Christianity in the Bible actually had an impact in my life. So I may have subscribed to the idea of God, but I probably was more literally like an agnostic to where I didn't actually know who God was. We have to examine the walls of Christianity. You know, some of us can think that there is nothing wrong with the walls of Christianity. We can think, you know, everything is just okay. I'm talking to everybody, even the disciples. I want to challenge you if you're a guest here. If you've grown up in a church where you just never fundamentally knew the Bible and you only went to church to check off the meeting for the week, but you never studied the Bible, I want to challenge you. Study the Bible. Figure out what it really means to follow Jesus so you no longer have to live in ignorance. You can now live in the light of the glory of God. Are you with me? For the disciples, my brothers and sisters, we have to examine the walls as well. That are we upholding the very standard of God? And specifically, I want to call us to examine the walls of total commitment. Is your heart totally committed to God? Or has commitment become an optional thing? That, hey, I may come to Wednesday night midweek, but if I work, then I just can't make it. You know, I scheduled my life kind of around the kingdom, but I I leave early from church because I got to go to work. Instead of being hard line and say, I'm going to be totally committed because the world has not seen total commitment since the first century. We have to examine the walls. You know, in chapter 3, Nehemiah then goes on and they begin this work. He employs and implores those who he's talking to, and they begin building. But it wasn't people that actually knew how to build a wall. Let me tell you, he got the perfume makers, he's got the wood makers, he's got the blacks, he's got farmers. Man, he's got, he's got all types of people. He got your kids. He said, grab your kids, grab your wife, we're going to build a wall. That was Nehemiah's ploy. Now, I, I, let, me, let, me, let me put this before you. Maybe none of us know how to build a wall. But just like Jesus says, you don't know have to know how to build. You simply have to put your hand to the plow and get working. Let's turn over to Nehemiah 4. Nehemiah 4. In verse 1. It says, when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are rebuilding, even if a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. They just pray. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Verse 6, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. And I believe we're working with all of our hearts. It says, but when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. My first point for you is, I mean, my second point 
is meet this threat. You know, throughout history, anytime someone fought to take a stand for conviction and called people to a standard of doing anything great in general, it had always been met with great opposition. They start to ridicule them, asking them these questions I believe many are asking us even here this morning. You know, they start asking, what are these weak Christians doing? Will they really restore what it actually means to be a Christian? Can they be the restoration movement? Will they really do whatever it takes? Will they have no limits like Ole talked about in contribution? Will they be able to really evangelize the nations in this generation? Can they really restore Christianity as destroyed and as muddied as it is? And to this, my brothers and sisters, friends and family, just by being here this morning, deciding to sit here in these seats, though I know we're pouring ourselves out, working with all of our hearts, exhausted, but with an excel of faith, I believe we smirk at each one of these questions and we say, you know what, to every single one of those questions, absolutely we're going to rebuild the walls. You know, here it goes on to verse 11. It says, also our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. It's kind of crazy. Because though they face this persecution from without, they also face the persecution from within. It says here that from amongst their own number, there was a faithlessness if they could actually do what they were laying hold of doing. I mean, we have to consider, with these people from within, they had not been working for 50 years. They had been stagnant. They had been dormant. They had been lifeless. There was no sense of hope that the job was actually going to get done anymore. In fact, they just became comfortable with the circumstances and just laid their arms down. He said, you know what? I guess this is just the way things are. I'm okay. You know what? As long as I have my little life and I build my life up, then I'll just be okay. You know, fear comes out in many ways. It comes out in the form of complaining. You know, we've been hard charging, working abnormally hard to just get things going here in the Metro Coast. And as Ole has announced that we had 11 additions in the past 11 weeks. That is weekly additions in the Metro Coast. You got to give it up for yourself. But with this incredible push, there can be a desire to want to take a break. Hey, let's, let, we're going fast. Let, let, let's just, please, can we just take our time? Let's have a break. Let me tell you something. In John 5, my God says that he never stops working. And my Bible also says that if I want to love Jesus, I got to live as Jesus did. So I too cannot stop working. Let, 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 let me just open your eyes really quickly and get a, glory, a little hole into the spiritual world war. Satan is not, not having a church service right now. Satan's got a leaders meeting going right now. Satan has employed a legion of demons to attack the hearts and minds of the ones that could be very revolutionized as you walk out of these doors. He's like, you know that seed that was planted in that Sunday service on February 5th? I am ready to swoop down and snatch that from you. Satan is not going to stop working. If you're a young Christian, you just got baptized. I am so proud of you. But your name was not X'd off and said, oh, darn it, we lost one. You became circled, underlined, italicized, parenthesized, quotated. You are now a target for Satan. I'm not saying anything that's not the reality for you already. I want to put before you that we have to be on our guard. But you know what I find? That when you stop working, and it doesn't have to be a major, complete, obvious step back. You can still be present, but not give all your heart. 
You know, the Bible actually says that you have to seek God with all your heart and then you'll find him. That wasn't just for when you were studying the Bible, actually. That's a lifestyle that we must live. Let, 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 let me put something before you. Satan is not asking for much. He says, just take 1% off. Go 99. He wins. He just wants 98% of your heart. I mean, he just wants 2%. He can take 2%. He doesn't need you to give him 50. He's like, I'll take two. Because that takes you out of giving all your heart to God. I want to ask you this morning. Are you really giving all your heart to God? <laughs> Family, I am not amiss. I am not unaware. We are going to face threats from without and from within. Now, as the family of God, I want to challenge us to meet this threat. We've got to endure persecution. And when our brothers and sisters begin to complain or they begin to see, hey, why don't we just build up our own lives instead of focusing so much on building the ministry, you've got to get in there as your brother and sister that you love them. Sit down, root it out with the Bible. Root it out with the Bible and say, hey, my Bible says faith comes from hearing the message. And my Bible also says that perfect love drives out fear. I want to drive out that fear in your heart. I want you to scream with a loud joy and an exhale of victory that yes, we can, yes, we will meet this threat. I just want to lift up a couple people that have met this threat time in and time again, over and over. That's the Bouyers right here. The Bouyers have met this threat time and time again. I got to lift up the Miles. The Miles have met this threat time in and time again. I got to lift up the Hammonds. I mean, years and years, all of these couples have constantly poured themselves out. Why? Because they're ready to fight the battle. Don't mistake it. No, I, I, it doesn't matter how they are young in spirit and they are fired up. I, I, let me tell you something. I bet any one of these would come up here and preach a, a more fiery lesson than I would right now. You know why? You know why? Because their hearts are in the building. They know this is the only hope for humanity. And I got to lift up the Hoaglands. I am so delighted, Salma and I, to be able to work closely with these two individuals, this incredible couple. You know what? With all that they have going on, you know what they say? For the family, we could do more. We could do more. And they're unyielding. They are unyielding. They want to serve. They want to give. And they're going to learn all, we're going to learn all the balance of how to do that. They're not going to be exasperated. But they are so willing to pour themselves out. It says, honor those who work hard among you. I want to honor these individuals right now. There has been nothing that they were unwilling to meet when it came to the threatening of God's house. Point number three. Why do we do this? Why do we fight? Why are we constantly willing to go back and forth and meet every threat? Because this is a fight for our families. Look at verse 13. It says, therefore, I station some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that there were, we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Yeah. Nehemiah's response to this radical persecution from without and one within was simply one thing. I've got to get these people to see how desperate of a situation we're in. No. I've got to help them to understand that this is not just some cute little church fun. That this is not just, hey, we're, we're going to play church for a little bit. Maybe you share your faith a little bit, and then you just call it extra credit in the kingdom. That's not what we're doing. Nehemiah was desperate. 
Desperation, I believe, is the greatest inspiration. But he didn't stop and back down and say, hey, guys, let's just take a break for today. Let's just go home and take a week off. Maybe we'll just have a load of family times. Nehemiah said, come hear all the people. Do you see? Look around. This is your brother, your sister, your daughters, your aunties, your uncles, your grandparents in the faith. You've got to fight for your family. The fight we're fighting is, yes, for our own salvation. Because if we don't actually take out the will of God, it's not like God's going to be like, oh, darn, you missed the mark. God expects us to get this done. God expects this of us. Because he understands that this is the only hope for all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. What we are building is for the generations to come after us. Nehemiah's heart, he wasn't mad. He was indignant toward the darkness, but compassionate towards the lost. He wanted to see people smile. You know, every time I come into church, and I get to see the smiles. Yeah, you too, Andre. You too. When I get to see the smiles of, when I get to see Paul Hahn singing on stage, it's not fair. It's not fair. When I see Mama Lorena and she just warms my hands up, and I just love that. I just love her hugs when I see Elizabeth, when I see Caleb, when I see Amaka, when I see the family of God. You know what I want to do? I want to fight for it. I know what it took to get us here. And I am uncompromising on doing what it takes to keep the safe safe, but go and seek and save the lost. As disciples, we're going to walk, chew bubble gum, swim, run at the same time. We're going to do all of it. You say, how is this possible? Well, my Bible says in Philippians 4.13 that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And when you're fighting for your family, Ole shared an incredible story of a man that was just fighting for his family. Why? Because his why was so determined. He was unwilling to quit even with a broken hip. There was nothing that was going to stop him. There was nothing that was going to stop him. It says in Matthew 9, 35, what was Jesus' heart for the lost? He looked at the world. He looked at the current physical state and spiritual state of Jerusalem. And he says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw that the people needed healing. And so what was his response? Just pray? No, 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 no. He prayed, but Jesus got to work. Jesus began rebuilding. He went to every town and village, teaching and healing every disease and sickness. You may be sick this morning. Well, you came to the right place because the Bible can heal you if you choose to obey it. I want to ask you, what's your why? Why do you build the kingdom? Why? Because your why is what's going to keep you going till you see God face to face. You know, I'm here because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But you know what's a catalyst that keeps me going? When I was a kid, I was like eight years old, ten years old, I would tell my, I told my mom, I was like, Mom, I'm going to become something where I can build you a house. She likes one-story houses with, like, the middle courtyard area. You remember that, Mom? Yeah, she loves that. And I told her, I was like, Mom, I'm going to build you that house. I want to do that. You know, then I, I, I became a disciple, and um, this, this thing became necessary. It's called, like, currency. They call it currency or something like that, or money. I think it's money. And I realized that that wasn't going to be the reality. But the reality, however, was going to be that I am going to build her a house. I'm going to build her a spiritual house, not built with bricks by human hands. I'm going to build her a house that's built with living souls. Every living soul is a brick to God's incredible kingdom. Right now, I'm not up here. I am not up here for any other reason. You know, I am here because I'm fighting for my family. Every time I study the Bible with somebody, every time I get into a meeting with somebody, I put the face of my nephew on them. And I say, what would you do if your nephew was in danger? What would you do if your mom was at risk? What would you do if this was your real brother and sister? You would have no limits. You wouldn't ask for more sleep. You would ask what needs to be done. 
It wouldn't matter to you. Because when you have no limits, you have no worries. This has got to be your real family. I am begging you from the bottom of my heart. This is my family. I don't want to hear the story about this movement could have possibly fallen. I know the history far too well. And I empathize with it. I empathize with our older brothers and sisters. Because I know the destruction and the reason why they're still here is because they're fighting for their families. Let me tell you something. I am fighting for every single one of us. I'm fighting for you. So I want to call you. I want to call us to fight for our families at UCLA. I want to call us to fight for our families at USC. I want to tell us to fight for our families in the singles. I want to tell us to fight for our families in the marrieds. I want us to tell us to fight for our families even in the teen ministry. Because here's the thing. We are building physical walls of Jerusalem all over the world and all over LA. We are rebuilding the walls of Christianity. I love you and to God be all the glory.